As a professional mariner, I shipped out all around the world. But what I enjoy the most is sailing on our boat with my family and our friends. I enjoy teaching and coaching kids exercise and healthy cooking. So we do the bananas, then we're going to add honey, we're going to add oats, we're going to add milled flaxseed for omegas, omega-3s, and then we're also going to add some crunchy peanut butter and some honey. My passion for boating, I kind of figured out along the way. And I knew how important it was for me. It's beautiful out on the water. Boating is a wonderful opportunity for your family, I think, to grow closer. Come, Come and join, join us on, on our, our next, next adventure, adventure on Bow Stern, Stern with Lori and Adam. We're here today at Coast Guard Station Point Allerton, here with Bosun's mate, First Class Rondina, and we're going to talk about unmanned adrift kayaks and other small boats. Well, I'm so happy you allowed us to come today. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Love your boat. Thank you, thank you. So many people may not realize just how much uh, trouble and effort it causes the Coast Guard and other first responders when small boats uh, get adrift. They treat a, a, an adrift boat with nobody on board as a real distress and have to launch a search for it. Uh, that involves quite a bit of effort, uh, time and money. Sometimes they even have to launch a helicopter so it can be a very resp uh, costly response for a small kayak that just got loose from where it was stored. Or a paddle board, or even inflatable. Yeah, or a Sometimes dinghy. you see those lovely inflatable unicorns. So these are the stickers. This is, they come in different colors, but this is the sticker. This is an extreme Sharpie. What that means is it's fade resistance, Correct. I believe, right? Yes. Okay, and this helps you guys find us if we have a problem. Correct, so you'll uh, label it with your name, phone number. Um, sometimes people like to put their address on it, so that way the Coast Guard's able to locate the uh, person if they're not um, on the kayak itself or any type of paddle craft. Mm -hmm. And if they're just at home, we're able to contact them and, and close that in certain case. And then we also have these lovely silver stickers now what is the use for this? So that's for if um, somebody is out in the water, um, it's kind of a reflective thing so that when the sun hits it, um, any type of uh, Coast Guard small craft or uh, aircraft um, or any type of other go government agencies can locate um, somebody in distress. Probably makes you more visible to other boaters too. Correct. Just, yeah. So if you're having a problem and you see a boat, you can like lift it up and go, hey, help me. Correct, that's one way to All do it. All right, well I didn't know. I, I, wasn't sure why right. I had these on there. I just know I was told to put them on, right, so I, right. I did as I was asked. Yep, absolutely. And <laughs> you know, as far as um, that one being one way of distress to get somebody's attention, um, if a boater doesn't see them and they're coming up close to them, they can wave that to make themselves more visible. So what boaters may also not realize is that if the Coast Guard does have to do a search mission, number one, it takes time. If they launch an aircraft, there's time limits for the aircraft and their crew. So it's entirely possible that the uh, air crew could use up their time searching for a boat that was just uh, gotten loose from its dock. And then later that day, there could be a real distress. They've exceeded their work hours or flight hours, and they're not available to respond. So there's costs beyond just the time and effort that is spent on the initial search. How much time can your crew go out on this boat looking for somebody? So it all depends on the uh, weather, the time of year, air temperature, water temperature, um, depending on the size of the vessel that we use. If we're using a smaller vessel as opposed to a larger vessel, um, that all kind of goes into a formula and it dictates how many hours of rest in between we need for each case. Now the other question is right now, it's, you know, it's warming up, but the water is still cold. Right. So could you talk a little bit about that? Is there problems with people that are boaters that, you know, jump in the water thinking like, oh, it's a beautiful hot day, let me jump in the water? Right, so not everybody would realize that, you know, it might be 70 degrees out, um, maybe even to mid-70s to 80 degrees, but the water temperature is still really cold, so it could be just 
coming into the 50 degrees. Um, so their body wouldn't be able to regulate that until they're in the water. And then the exposure to that water element will cause them to fatigue quicker, hypothermia might still set in and they don't realize and they're not really dressed appropriately for that. So I've read that you should dress for the water temperature and not the air temperature. You can kind of think of it that way. And a big reason for that when the water is cold, because everybody thinks of hypothermia, but even in very cold water, it takes a little while for hypothermia to set in. But what can happen very quickly is you can just become incapacitated by the cold. Your muscles just don't work normally. And I just, I watched a film on this for a survival class I had to do. And literally it just becomes very difficult to swim or grab onto things or even pull yourself out of the water just in a few minutes in cold water, uh, long actually before hypothermia sets in. So again, when it's a nice warm day in the early spring, uh, it's important to wear a life jacket because if you fall in the water, it's a whole different story. A summer, normally, how many times do you have to go out looking? would you say, just on average, for just Point Allerton Station? Uh, so Point Allerton, I mean, it, it all depends on, um, you know, a lot of it ha does have to do with the economy, how many times people are willing to go out, um, stuff like that. For paddle craft in general, we can see anywhere from 25 to 100 cases. Wow. Um, and some of them might be just, you know, a 15 minute where they are labeled, we are able to contact the owner, and then we're able to suspend that search. Um, so it just depends on, on labeling and who's out there. So those labels are really important. Absolutely. How many times would you say the watercraft is labeled? Half or um, I would say a little bit less than half. We okay. have start seeing it be better with um, boaters labeling all their stuff, trying to get the word out. So it has gotten improved. That's good. That's good. Well, that's why we're here today. Absolutely. About a storm, we want to make sure everybody is safe out there on the water. Right, Adam? That's right. Three things you could do for better small boat safety is to mark it. That's having the identification sticker on board, having your name. If you don't have one of those stickers, then just a piece of tape with your name and phone number and maybe address. Or you can go to your local harbor master who will have those stickers. Right. We belong to boat clubs and they have those stickers in the clubs, but you can go to your local harbor master and ask for those stickers. It's something that, and I think even the police station may have it in the fire station, but right. check around, get those official stickers. You have to rewrite them every season because they do fade, but at least with the extreme shoppie, it should last the season here, at least in Massachusetts. The important thing is just to get your name, your number, a way to contact you so the Coast Guard can close the case. And related to that is to secure the boat when it's stored. If it's in a rack, tie off the painter on the beach, tie off the painter so it doesn't get loose in the first place. Tell them what a painter is, Adam, because well, everybody doesn't know what a painter is. They're thinking you got to paint the Painter wall. or other <laughs> line which secures the boat. So it's a bow line on the boat. So of course the second element it, you could say is file it. File a float plan, which can be as simple as just telling a responsible person where you're going when you expect to come back. Checking the weather and knowing your limits, both about the conditions, the weather, and, and how far you go. And then the third general principle is wear it. Wear a life jacket, PFD. Have a device to communicate, a waterproof uh, phone or VHF radio, and use the buddy system. Go with a friend out so you're not alone in your paddleboard or kayak. So, kind of three simple rules of thumb, mark it, file it, wear it. wanted to ask what is the role of the U.S. Coast Guard? So the Coast Guard's primary mission is search and rescue. Um, so we're the number one agency for that. Mm -hmm. um, we respond to all cases if somebody calls that they have a loved one that's in distress or they themselves call that they're in distress um, or with filing the float plans if somebody is due to return at a certain time and they haven't um, they can give us a call and we'll, we'll go into further um, uh, details and questioning and you know, where they're supposed to go and all that stuff. Um, so that way we are able to uh, locate them or have 
a reference of where they should be. It's fun to have fun in the water, but you do have to take but care. You have to know how. You have to know how, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Stealing Dr. Seuss's line. Um, yes, absolutely. So this has been a glorious day. We're going to get some more pictures and information for you, but please talk to us about this beautiful boat you have here. So this is our 47-foot motor lifeboat. Um, it's used in primarily in uh, harsher weather conditions, mm -hmm. so we're able to go out there in what they call heavy weather or surf conditions if there are uh, boaters out there during the winter season. Um, it has the uh, capabilities of rewriting itself, so if we do roll over it, it comes back up. Um, we use this mainly for that um, heavy weather designation, but you, you will see it for any type of search and rescue case as well. Mm -hmm. Have you been to the surf school at the Columbia River? So I went to the heavy weather portion of it, so I have been out there in, in uh, Cape Disappointment. Neat. Yes. Cape Disappointment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. I mean, it's hardcore. They like roll the boats over. Absolutely. Like say. Yeah, it's yeah. Not on purpose all the time. Yeah. It's, if, if it happens during a trading evolution, yes. How many people or boats would be involved in a typical uh, unmanned adrift response? So typically of the severity of the case, we would bring uh, one asset on average with a minimum of four people. Um, if there are multiple people in distress, we would bring more crew members. Um, so that way we're able to safely conduct the operations and bring the distressed boater or um, person in the water on board. So just depending on, on um, how many people are out distressed themselves. And like what circumstances might require involvement of a helicopter? So helicopters will respond to any case that we would respond to, especially if they have to be transported to somewhere uh, medical where they need a quicker response time. Uh, that's when the helicopters get involved. Alan, thank you so much for allowing us to come and film you and ask you a bunch of questions. Absolutely, anytime. And do I now get to drive the boat? As long as your qualifications are all signed off. I'll That's work on a that. a nice way of <laughs> saying no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for joining us on... Bow to Stern. See you next time.